So as, uh, as Daryl very kindly introduced me, my, my role with uh, MBN is as their chairman, but I have a number of other hats I wear, and believe it or not, believe it or not uh, a number of other identities that go with that. So um, I'll share one or two of those with you. I'm Forrest, 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 Paul Forrest, um, in, the, um, in the business world, in the world that's all serious world. and grown up, and then at weekends, some evenings on at least 100 days a year. You can see me in shorts and t-shirt wearing contact lenses being shouted at by 25 year old directors as steady on. Where I heft around this great bit of kit that you might have seen at the football called a steady cam. And I have a camera on top of that and I'm normally filming two very aloof people who frankly look like they'd rather be somewhere else. We call them actors. And actors generally are the bane of my life. Um, there's something in me, deep-rooted, that says I could never, ever direct a film. You know, I've just forgotten this is being live-streamed. I could never, ever direct a film on the grounds that I dislike actors. <laughs> Having said that, they're, they're pretty much important to, uh, to, to us in making films, so I'm kind of tolerant of them. And then we have MBN Solutions, and what we try to do is we try to find people, the very best people with the best skills, the best cultural fit, to work in business, in industry, at large, in and around blockchain, big data, data science, insight and analytics, digital transformation, and IT. And we pride ourselves on hosting events like this, where we're able to talk a little bit about our thought leadership, what we think is going on and why it's important. And we share that not as an open advert, but as a mechanism to say to people, look, we know about this stuff, and we know probably as much as a lot of other people, and actually we've got our hands dirty doing some of this, so if you really want to know where to get the best people, if you really want to know where we found the best people, come and have a chat with us. So that's the plug for that over. But I will guarantee, rest assured, there'll be at least three other plugs in this presentation, but they'll be for films. And I would expect you all to go out and buy them. Um, but before I kick off, I just want a quick show of hands. I want you to be really, really honest with me. Really, really, really honest. And this is going to be a difficult one. I'm not taking names, getting numbers, but I'd like to know who here has ever, whether they do it now or not, downloaded a film from the internet and watched it. Yeah. Watch this. So have I. So there's an element of this which is about saying, well, actually, that's... that's that's, that's not good, is it? Because obviously somewhere someone is probably going to go a little bit hungry as a result of that. But actually, it's not good because we create an environment that allows that to happen. And we, act, we actually actively engage and encourage it with the technologies we have available to us. If you've got a box at home called a Kodi, anyone got a Kodi? Well, one, two, three. That's, four. that's not statistically representative. Statistically, 35% of the audience should have Kodi boxes. So you're either not being open about it or you don't know it's a Kodi box. Bought it on eBay and it just shows you all the satellite channels. Yeah, there's a few nods, good. Now look, my view is, is I make films, I don't really care who sees them. I don't really care whether they're paying for them all, so long as I've achieved my duty of care, which is to give an income back to the investors who very kindly put their money into our films. I have a, a fiduciary responsibility to maximise that. And that fiduciary responsibility to maximise that investment is about making sure I do everything possible to ensure that it gets out there, gets seen, and people pay for it. But I'm also cognizant of the fact that with film, and you tell me, you'll see some things you like and you'll see some things you dislike. I'll paraphrase that. Some things are really great, they're ball-achingly good, and some are shockingly shite. Yeah? All seen a film recently that falls into one or other categories? Yep, good. Terrestrial providers normally help us out there, um, but Sky seem to be doing quite a good job these days. Oh, God, you're live streaming this, aren't you? <laughs> there goes my deal with Sky. The point is, is that we can't afford to, to try to make films that work for everyone because there's no such thing. There really is no such thing. And we can't afford to make films for a very, very narrow niche. So we have to try and put a lot of effort into working out what's going to do well. But it's problematic because we don't necessarily get the information, the data. It's still driven by gut and feel. 
And it's driven, even when people tell you they've got this complex Monte Carlo simulation that tells them how to calculate whether a film will sell or not, at that point, we all develop coughs in the room and push it. Because we know that you can't use a model to try and determine that sentiment to that extent on a global market. You might be able to do it territory by territory. You might be able to do it by postcode by postcode. But the prospects of actually doing that globally are next to none. So we have to look at it and say, well, what do we feel? How do we feel about this? And the problem we have then is we end up trying to produce something which ultimately um, might hit the mark and be hugely entertaining for people to watch and that people are prepared to put their hand in their pocket and part with hard cash to go and see it or buy a DVD. But the problem as filmmakers is that at that point, we rarely see the money. Anybody here made a film? Anybody here been on a film crew? Anyone in university, wherever? Yeah, okay. It's great fun, isn't it? You get out there, you mix it up. It's, it's, I mean, I love it. I absolutely love it, and I don't mind being shouted at that by 25-year-olds, really. I don't. They confuse me with someone who cares. They care about film. However, however, I go back to this point about the duty of care to the investors, because they won't invest twice. A film as an asset class is problematic because most people won't invest twice if they don't get a, a, a return on their investment the first time round. And one of the biggest problems we have with that is that we're not able to offer that because we don't have absolute visibility across the entire value chain within film. So who thinks they know the film value chain? And I'm not even going to put my hand up here. This is a tough one. It's a hard one. It really, really is. So I'm going to introduce you to a little bit of that. But I'm going to do it in the context of blockchain because I genuinely, genuinely, genuinely believe that blockchain has some answers. And our early proof of concept around blockchain as a, an enabler for, I'm going to say transformation here rather than disruption in the film industry, and I'll explain why later, I think it's got a genuine prospect of being able to do it. And I think it could be epic. But I have to stress, I think it's going to be more epic for us independent filmmakers than it will be for the studios. So if Warner or Universal or anyone else of that ilk or size, say Sony, who took over from MGM to make the Bond films, if they're watching and they're thinking about this, guess what? They don't like it. But I'll also explain why they don't like it as we go through. They really don't like it. They've tried desperately to close us down. Haven't you? I really do know they're not watching, by the way. So it's, it's a Wednesday night. Where else are they going to be? They're going to be somewhere, they're in a bar somewhere discussing their latest blockbuster. Look, we think, we do a lot with IBM from, uh, from MBN, and we think they're starting to get this to the extent that some of the things they're saying are actually really quite interesting. This is the tip of the iceberg. If you look at any of the writings that fell out of the report that this quote came from, it's quite, it's quite exciting because they genuinely do think it's one of the few pieces of technology and technological innovation that will actually have a global transformational effect in a variety of industries in a variety of sectors. Part of the issue is, is that it's in hundreds of sectors. Anybody want to hazard a guess? 100, 200, 300? Anyone? How many sectors? Hundreds, 200? 500, yeah. I mean, my view is, is I think it's probably going to be one of those figures that no one will ever be able to count accurately, but it's almost certainly going to be well up into the four five hundreds. There are various people that have come out over the course of the last year saying it's 150, it's 200, it's 50. I look at that, I scratch my head and I think, well, how the hell do you know? How do you know? How many sectors have been involved in building this room, in getting us here tonight, in getting us into this room, in getting a beer into our hands? How many sectors have been involved in doing that? Quantifying and asking how many have been involved is a very difficult thing to do because we don't often think about the deep supply chain that sits behind what arrives at our front door. Do we have to? Well, actually, I think when it comes to blockchain, it's important to start pushing the thoughts in that direction because who dabbles in blockchain technologies here? Who does any development work? Yeah, okay. You tell me, how difficult is blockchain to develop in? 
Medium. Medium, right. It's easier than some of the more complex um, uh, data science type activities, but it's more difficult than building a website in PHP. Until the price of the chain that you're using goes up. Right, exactly, exactly. But the point with all of this is it's, it's manageable, it's masterable. Is that a real word? Sounds real. It's masterable. It's something you can get your teeth into and you can learn it with relative ease. The problem is, is I meet on almost a daily basis 10 to 15 people who tell me we're blockchain developers. And I think they're just another techie who's yet to discover a cause. And I mean that. And I mean it in terms of the cause, I mean it in terms of the sector, I mean it in terms of the functionality, I mean it in terms of the application. And frankly, you know, if, if all you're about is, is Bitcoin or some form of cryptocurrency, I think you're missing a trick. Because I think that's the tip of the iceberg. And actually, I think there's much more fun things that can be done out and about with blockchain. And I think this is where this point comes from. So if you explore some of these, and um, I've never counted up how many there are there. Somebody, I have no doubt, will look at this and count them up. But um, slides are available afterwards. You don't need to, uh, to, to dive into the detail because I appreciate it's not particularly readable from there. But these are just use cases. And for each of the use cases, there are probably 10 to 15 good quality examples that aren't on the slide. I know because we do blockchain around film and we've been pushing that since, since I don't know, 2014, something like that, and um, 2015. And I know there are probably 10 to 15 others doing the rounds at the moment in private blockchains. And, and they all have some good functionality, but it's actually a question of how we bring that together and create this simple, single, consolidated view of how blockchain enables a change within film. I think that's probably true of a lot of other industries and sectors. I think trying to get to that singular purpose is tough. So there's a few on there. Has anybody used any of the ones on the slide they can read? Listen, I'm close to the slide and I can't read it. Oh, good, you have. Good. Yes, yeah. So there's some interesting ones around digitizing assets as well, which I quite like, because that plays into the film space. And again, in trying not to reinvent the wheel, we don't try to do things that other people do better or do well already. But there then is this issue of how we create this interoperability. And one of my concerns, I'll talk about a little bit later on, is standards and a common lexicon that drives understanding for the way in which you might do blockchain in digitizing assets, and I might do it over here in film. Is that a fair comment? I mean, that's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge we face. So um, let's think about now, let's think about the film industry and transformation. Who thinks the film industry has changed dramatically over the last 100 years? Anyone? You think it's changed? Okay, what, what do you think in particular has changed about it? It's not black and white. Though, it's not black and white? Well, sometimes it is. We, we get out of our way to film black and white stuff. So we call it art house. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, in the main, certain aspects have changed. We shoot a lot more now on digital platforms. Basically, computers with a bit of glass in front of the, the sensor. But even that, that has been slow. Who knows the story about how we democratize filmmaking with digital filmmaking? Anyone? Who's got a pair of Oakley sunglasses? It's your fault, bugger. Can't believe you didn't have the nerve to wear them to the presentation. <laughs> Sunny enough. Now look, the guy behind that, Jim Jenner, great guy, sold the company, sold Oakley, made a fortune, but it was a passionate filmmaker, a passionate cinematographer, and said, you know what I want to do? What I want to do is I want to rock the world. I want to change people's minds about how they can go to the market and make a film for next to nothing. But you know what? Film cameras cost a quarter of a million pounds, and they do. You buy an Arri 535, you buy a Movecam 35 mil, you buy an Anton Penelope, they're going to cost you that sort of money. You can buy a used one that's 15 years old in bits and hopefully put it back together because all the bits are there, and you can do that for about 65, 75 grand. Good luck with that. Then you've got to buy your film stock to make the film. Then you've got to develop your film stock. Then you've got to print it up and you've got to adjust, and then you've got to produce multiple film prints to send that around the world. So Jim said, no, no, no I'm not having that. Um, so he went to something called NAB in the States and he went to NAB and he set up this uh, tent, it was a bit like a, an army tent except it was black 
and he set it up and he put a sign outside saying, Q here. It's a true story. Q here. And lots of people queued because that's human nature. You see a sign that says Q here, people were queuing all the way around the block. And they got inside and there was a sign saying, have a look at this picture. And on the picture, there was a thing, a thing, it was called a red one. The red one was a thing. It didn't look like a film camera. Frankly, it looked like a computer with a hole on the front. It looked like something that if you asked me as a camera operator, would I feel proud of having that on my shoulder? The answer is no, never in a million years. But he said, you can make Hollywood films with this. I'm going to charge 12 and a half thousand pounds if you put down your deposit today for 2,000 pounds. And by the way, just so you know you're getting something, I'm going to give you this lump of aluminium that I've had machined into our fir the first letter of our name, red. There you go. Two and a half grand, I've got a lump of aluminium. Neat. God knows what I'm going to do with that. But all of a sudden, we went from people who spent years at film school learning to make films the old way, learning the way light works with celluloid, the way light responds to lenses and glass and filters. And we went from that to, oh, my mum's just bought me a red one for my birthday, so I'm a cinematographer. So you turn up on set and you'd be competing with someone a third of your age. I mean it, a third of your age. Standing there with this box, and he was a computer wizard. Couldn't frame for toffee, couldn't focus, because he didn't realise that actually in film, I don't know how many of you know this, you all if you know this, but we have focus pullers. So as a camera operator, I don't even focus the lens myself. That's not my job. I've got a guy who does that. All I do is I get the frame up. I light the shot. I make it look good. This is rock and roll. It's a bit fuzzy over there. Do you mind pulling focus and making that sharper? Thank you. Otherwise, you're fired. Focus puller. But of course, all these guys didn't know that. So they suddenly started coming around and they started to realise they needed more than the 12 grand to make this. But actually, 12 grand and I can now make a feature film. And the disruption that happened then, and it was disruption, was when Peter Jackson of um, uh, Lord of the Rings fame, or King Kong if you're that way inclined, or any number of interesting films. Say again? Yeah, well, that was probably one of his better films being honest. Um, certainly appealed to my senses more. He came along and he made a short film, a Second World War film, with the Red One, and it looked awesome. And people saw this and said, wow, that's, that's fantastic. This will rock the world. Why didn't it rock the world? Well, it didn't rock the world because there's these guys putting out cameras from Germany at 250 grand, Ari, Guys called Panavision. Who's heard of Panavision? You see it at the end of lots of films. Panavision. You can't actually buy a Panavision camera, ever. Even if you're George Lucas. When he makes Star Wars films on film, they loan him a special camera that's sprayed black with a name like Death Star or Rebel Base on it. And you can hire that. And you can hire that for around about 450 quid a day for a typical production. Say so Star Wars is Star Wars is typically a 40-week production. Most films are actually about eight weeks. Independent films are typically two to four weeks. So it gives you an order of magnitude. So they're paying a fortune to hire a camera. And of course, Panavision have made their money ten times over. So they don't want some upstart coming in and selling you a digital camera that's going to basically allow you to make a film as good as Hollywood will. So they're not really into disruption, they don't get it, but they're actually even less into transformation. And that's been a big challenge for us. The problem you get is filmmaking is not, is not ever going to get away from the fact that you can't develop or deliver a half-arsed outcome. I can't say to you, I've made half a film, are you interested in seeing it? Because the answer is no. And I can't easily convert that to an episodal piece that then goes out on television because the television market buys different output and product. So I've got to make the whole thing. I've got to get, I've got to get on with it and I've got to do it. The problem with it as well is that technologists are actually trying to focus on the acquisition of the image and they're not trying to put real effort into the back end where you can make a difference by allowing post-production to be more slick. We'll talk a bit more about that later because blockchain helps there. And then my favourite point on here and uh, I'd love to see if there's anyone who disagrees with this, but actually films, every film is a prototype because you don't know what you've got until you finish the thing. 
you can head in a broad direction of travel. But until you've got there and you're in a screening theatre looking at it, you don't know what you've got and what needs to be done to rescue, improve, modify, improvise, overcome or adapt. So you end up with a prototype. It's not a product, it's a prototype. It's always a prototype. And it's expensive. It's expensive. I'll take you through a case study in a little while. Yeah, I will. And I will tell you about a film we made for £127,000 and everyone on that film got paid. Absolutely everyone on that film got paid. They got paid within three days of putting their fee notes in. So they all got paid and it made a lot of money selling around the world, which is great. So the investors got their money back and we got our film seen. But the problem is, is it was still expensive for what we did. And we know, we look at it and go, well, we're clever filmmakers. We did this much cheaper, much more cost effectively. But actually, we could have done it even cheaper if we'd had something like blockchain driving this process. And I'll evidence that as I go. And I'll give you the spoiler now. I delete 2,500 copies, illegal copies, of that particular film every week using the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And do you know what the horrible thing about that is? Look at this, I don't even have to look at this. Who uses Google? Yeah, yeah, yeah I get it, you all do, right? The problem with Google is Google, when they delete things using the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, they then put a little link at the bottom saying, if you'd like to see the subject of this complaint, click here. And then they list all the URLs they've deleted of all the illegal copies, all of them. So you just pick one of those and copy and paste it into your subject line. Oh, there you go. Job done. So it's a, a terrible, never-ending job. I spend far too much time doing that every week. Now, if you're not already getting the message that blockchain can help with that, if you're not already getting the feeling that actually that's something that can be largely automated and made very simple, very straightforward, but also you can put into it, you can inject into it a mechanism that allows people to almost from a democratic way say, well, you know, I watched it. I watched it on Cody. It was all right. It wasn't brilliant. It wasn't bad. Here you go. Here's a quid. Fill your boots. Because I feel bad about taking that from you anyway. But that's, again, where blockchain can come into its own. And the trials we've run work very effectively for people to pay on the choice as a result of what they've seen. So I then very quickly moved to an environment where I said, well, I don't care. You watch it. Fill your boots. All watch it. Pay what you think it's worth. And if you like these people that are quite happy to go into IMDb forums and say, you're shite. It's the worst film ever made. How did this film get made? How did they raise money to make this film? It is atrocious. If they don't take them outside now and execute them, something has gone horribly wrong. That's at the lighter end of the review scale. Sorry, you... Um, how's that? So you end, you end up... Is that, is that coming through? Oh, it's the cable, is it? Right, there you go. So you end up with a situation, a scenario, whereby, you know, you're trying to do the right things, but actually blockchain could help people to do the right things. Who here would pay something? Let's not quantify it, but it could be as little as a penny, or it could be as much as 3 99 to stream a film. Who would pay something? Yeah. Many years ago, I stood in front of a major record label, and I told them if they charged a penny for every known illegal download. This was in 1998, when MP3 players were A, very expensive, and B, quite scarce. There was a richer sounds just around the corner that used to sell them. And you could go in there and part with 100 quid to get one that would play eight tracks. Brilliant. Used to feel so good running down the road carrying this thing. It was bigger than your bus, you know. It was just a huge MP3 player. But, you know, times have moved on. Now we can get entire music libraries in our iPhones. But we told them at the time, if you could charge a penny a go, how would that feel? That would be 289 million pounds of incremental profit. And you could just say, well, OK, well, we're not doing anything with that. So why don't we say anybody who volunteers to pay that penny, volunteers to pay that penny, we'll take half of that, we'll send it to a good cause, and we'll take the other half, and we'll have a big piss up. Yeah. But it's changed. It's changed. And already, people like Taylor Swift, she's on Spotify. Fill your boots if you're a Taylor Swift fan. I'm not. I've got two kids who are. They love it. Oh, jeez. I actually 
could probably recite some, but I'm not going to, you'll be pleased to hear. I could probably recite some. But the point is, is people are coming around because we're seeing that, 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 that transformation. It's now changed the way we buy and consume music. When was the last time, and be honest, when was the last time you actually went out of your way to buy an album versus buying a track? It's not, not a bit. A couple of days ago. Right, but it's not a lot of people. That's three people in I the room. Right, now I tend to buy albums, but I think it's an age thing. I've got a 29-year-old son at the other end of the kid's scale, and my 29-year-old son has never bought anything other than single tracks because he's grown up with that, and that for him is the norm. And he likes to assemble the tracks on the basis of what he wants to hear rather than what they wanted to record or put out. And he probably knows something I don't know, or actually probably knows something I do know, which is virtually every single album I've got, I've got at least three tracks on there I really don't like. And I skip through them. So there is this change, it's coming about. So what, what about film? Could we do that in film? Would you pay? Would you pay something? And if it's only a penny, if it was a simple token, a license? Independence, though, because like, Spotify, you know, independent survive on Spotify. Say again? Independent musicians of, uh, can't survive on the money that they make from Spotify. I can't comment on what an independent musician would or wouldn't do. What I can say is the album for the soundtrack for the film I'm going to give you the uh, case study on went out through Spotify and it made more money according to the music label and the composer than it would have had it been put out through a traditional print release. Made more money. And that is a piece of classical composition which frankly is never going to be leaping off the shelves. But that's put down to the fact that people have this habit now of engaging in listening to music that they wouldn't ordinarily have listened to or purchased, and having listened to it, it's still driving a revenue stream, albeit a smaller revenue stream. My point here is, even with a smaller revenue stream, if I could take a penny for every one of the two and a half thousand copies that were being shown of our film every week, I'd be happy. Because that would be more revenue than this is the bit that really shouldn't be streamed, live streamed. That's more money than I'm likely to have disclosed to me by certain people acting in my best interest as a distributor in another country. Where they might have had 100 people come to the cinema, or 100 people buy a DVD or a Blu-ray, or 100 people pay for it for VOD. But what they tell me is a fundamentally different number. That's the problem we're trying to get rid of. That's the problem the musicians try to get rid of in cross-territory licensing deals. It's hard. Spotify does solve that. Blockchain can solve it. But it's not a panacea, and we know that. But we think, we think, we could get closer to it if people accepted that these are the challenges you've got. My, my, my final point on here, I'm going to move on from this slide, because I'm conscious of time, and I, believe it or not, need to get to Leeds for quarter to one Thursday morning. Um, Unless you're a major studio or a mini major, you're unlikely to have all of the skills necessary to make a film. For those of you who've worked on a film set, you probably notice it's a bit like watching someone come to a soup kitchen. Who'd worked in a film? Yeah. So it's a bit like watching people arrive at a soup kitchen. You know, they come in, you don't really know who they are, they do their job, they go and get fed by craft services, they walk away, and you might meet them on the next job. We have this expression we use, which is, see you on the next one which basically means, don't know who you are, don't know your name, probably never ever see you again, but if I do, I'll say the same next time I see you. The majors all have their cadre of very expensive filmmakers that they can control. Therefore, they have absolute visibility of their oh. entire, bless you, their entire supply chain. We don't have that visibility in independent film, and we can never get it. Uh, we've got some issues around that, and I'll explain those in a moment. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm probably... Yeah, let me leave this one up for a second. So in terms of those people, what it means is that we have lots of people to convince or change attitudes with in order to do something different. A lot of people, so the DP, the director, that's fine. That's one thing they're creative. But the producer, you have to convince them it's a good thing. The distributor, the sales agent, the people who are exhibiting your film in their theater, the people who are stocking the shelves in the supermarket with your product. Let me tell you this, if you've worked on a film, I hate to disappoint you, but the way that the supermarkets select films, and this is why you'll notice certain traits with films I make, they go down an aisle where they're all laid out on a DVD stand. 
and they normally only get as far as maybe D or E. So they go through the A's, the B's, the C's. So funnily enough, every film I make starts with an A, B or a C. Because they won't get bored by the time they get to E and decide that's it, they've done enough. And then the second piece of criteria is they look at the one sheet, which is the front cover, and they say, oh yeah, exciting front cover. There's no resemblance. I was showing the guys earlier today. The case study film I'll show you the, uh, the one sheet for, when it went out in Japan, the only thing that was missing from the DVD cover was Godzilla. The only thing. It had in the film, but we have no control over that because that's what they think will sell that over there. And some guy would have pulled it off the shelf and said, yeah, I'll have that, thanks. And off they went. But the problem is we have no control over these people. We have no influence over them. We've got no prospect of telling them that innovation will deliver great and incremental benefits to them. We have no ability to change their model because their model sits outside of our control in retail and in theatres, theatres or exhibition. Exhibition is all about what you're prepared to part money with to go and see. My theatre tonight might be similar to one. And then finally here, very few of them are interested in creating further opportunities. They just are not. And the issue is, is none of this is of interest to these guys, which is why they'll close you down. And guess what? Where do you go to see a film? Cinema? Yeah. Still nice to go to the cinema. Cinemas tend to be owned by the big chains. Not always, there are independents. But if you're a big fan of independence, I'll tell you now, back to trade union for filmmaking, have a strike this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, for the largest independent in the country called the Picture House, because they won't pay the living wage. So go figure, at the top end you've got the majors who own theatres who won't play ball, at the bottom end you've got the independents who won't play ball. So you've got this issue where they don't want to change, they don't want to experience anything different to what they had historically, traditionally, and for over 100 years. They might show you a black and white film occasionally. I think, what was it? I um, can't remember the name of that one that won the Oscars. Did you particularly enjoy it? The one with the dog. So a lot of this comes down to the fact that films are not products. Films are prototypes, and they're continually available. Let's just pick a couple of points on here in the interest of time. Each film is designed for a specific audience. We will target that audience quite tightly. So the case study film, 1959 Cold War space thriller. Wow, that's narrow. But it works because we know that there are a lot of people who like sci-fi, and as that sci-fi audience, a lot of them also like Cold War, so there's a nice overlap there, brilliant Venn diagram. And actually, we get a bit of tension in there because the three-way uh, interchange between the Russians, the Americans, and the British, great, even better. But again, as I explained to the guys on the way over here today, we had an issue in that we put the film out in one particular territory where it went out with a Ukrainian, non-Russian, Ukrainian heavy title, cancer. But when it went over there, the people printing the, the posters in the UK, who were Russian Ukraines, changed the name and the spelling. And the film was a flop. We put it out three weeks later with the correct posters and the film was a success. And it just goes to show how some of these things can have quite a huge impact, little no real control. But this is down to finding your audience and influencing them. I guarantee that most of you, not all of you, but most of you, when you go to the cinema, you, if you have a free choice, will select a film, you haven't already decided what you're going to see, you'll select it typically based on the quality of what we call the one sheet the poster or who's in it, or the story of promoted by that poster. You don't look at it and make a decision based on the fact that, well, that's a, that's a, that's a 250 million pound film. And that one's a 127,000 pound film. That probably doesn't even come into it. Otherwise, you never can see films like Trade But actually, because of that, we can get to our audience, our specific audience, with great ease. The problem is we can't necessarily get to part with cash. But what it means is distribution needs to therefore be bespoke. So when we deal with our distributor in China, Korea, Russia, UK, Ireland, we have to come up with plans that help them to do their job and keep them honest. I'm not saying they're dishonest, please remember for the record, I'm not saying they're dishonest. But actually sometimes they don't count everything that happens. So for example, we send over um, 
a film print, a digital film print that has a little thing in it. Does anybody have a little snitch? Yeah, you know how the snitch works? So we put an internet connected pixel into the leader for the film. So when we roll film, we know what time we roll it, we know what camera, we know what's going on better in what cinema. So you can tell how many times it's played out because we match that with the start, middle, and end pixel. We can do that. That's easy. And we do do it. So we get a report that says, hey, your film, yeah, it's really not been popular. It's only shown 55 times in three weeks. And we look at it and say, well, of course, it's actually played out just over a thousand times. And I'd really like to go back to my investor and give them a bit more money so they invest in the next film. And I'd like to go back to my distributors and I'd like to give them more of a bonus to do a good job in getting out of that territory. I'm not casting aspersions, but I don't really know why that happens, other than I suspect it's to do with the fact that the way deals work, you know, the way deals work with films, is that I make a film, they will give me what's called a minimum guarantee, which is what they think they will get from their theatre for playing it. So they might give me $25,000. Then they add in their expenses, which might be five thousand dollars in posters, in bus stops, etc., etc., etc. And then what they'll do is they'll say, "We'll take all of that off what we actually make, and then we'll split the difference 50-50." So splitting the difference 50-50 when it's only played out a hundred times versus a few thousand has a big impact. <coughs> Does anybody here think that blockchain might help with that? Anyone? Yeah, good. What well, only one? Really? I'm shocked. I'm shocked because we thought that's damn well going to help with that. Because we can now control that, we can audit it, we can do it in a way that is friendly and engaging. Because what we're doing is we're not saying we're auditing your numbers and saying you're a liar. We're actually providing management information back to them because they're participants in our block. We're sharing that with them. Say again? Film coin. Yeah, film coin, thank you. But the way it's done, of course, is it's actually looking at how they can take that data and create better plans and better promotional activities to get more out of it. They now, we can say to our Japanese um, uh, distributors, for example, we can say, when you change the poster at week three, it had this effect. Now, you know, we can never truly say that changing the poster meant that it doubled the audience. We, we can't show you that. We can say, it appeared to do that. What else were you doing around week three that drove that? That wasn't word of mouth. And the interesting thing is we can also calculate word of mouth, we reverse engineer word of mouth by using the digital downloads and the site visits that we get after that to be, um, what do they call it, the uh, trivia. Trivia in the uh, electronic press game. <laughs> it's not accurate, but it's close enough for government work. So this could be quite useful in keeping these guys honest, but also helping them to do their job and do their job better. But who are we actually talking about? Who here is a creative? Who's a photographer? Who's a musician? You're a musician? I get a feeling you're a musician. Yeah. Musician, okay, good. So you probably will have some empathy with some parts of this fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. It's there, trust me. There we go. So this is the flow chart that they give you at film school. This is how you work out what you should be doing. Yeah, someone's actually read it. Well done. So, You've worked out already that what this is, is it's something that shows you. The problem is, is the industry is full of people with different views, different perspectives of what everyone else does and why they do it, and what they contribute and what they don't contribute. And as a result, we end up with this whole situation where you might be given here as a character actor thinking, I've done my bit and I've done my job, and now I'm going to take my pay and off I go. We think it's different. We try to democratise it to the extent that everybody on this page has both a say and a role in making the film, but also a say and a role in what we do with money. So they help us to pick where some of our excess proceeds go, which charity they end up with and why. They also help us to distribute that cash because what we do is we ask them who they think are worthy recipients of an uplift or a bonus. And they share it. Now, I'm fairly certain that a quick counter to that will show you that if we blockchain enabled that one, and put everyone a little on a smart contract, we could do quite a lot with them in terms of being able to make that process even easier, more friendly, more straightforward, and as a result, hopefully, mean that they get a better share of the wallet, more than living wage. 
and they get a little bit further into the industry as a result of being seen as a positive contributor to the world of independent film. There's a lot of people on that chart. At the moment, they'll come in, they'll do a job, and they'll go. That's not because that's the way the industry needs to be. That's because they believe that they are a one-man band doing a one-man job in a big team. Probably used to use session musicians. No. No. But those environments where they bring in, so we, we, so we had 73 live players in our orchestra on May Bank Holiday 2015. It's a great experience, and phenomenal, phenomenal musicians. But you know, I look at that, I could not get to invest in our film, or we were investing in our film. But actually, what we could do is we could stand up and tell them that based on performance, they would all get 100% uplift on their pay for the day if we get a certain number of sales of the DVD and of the soundtrack separately. Thank you for that. There you go. Try the best. But actually, how many of them knew we would do that that could honestly hold us to that? And how many of them knew the numbers we're sharing with them are authentic numbers? Do you know how many contracts, for those of you who worked in film, you might know this, but how many contracts are signed between the producer and the director and the executive producer and these people? How many of these contracts are signed where there is an amount of pay and then there is a percentage based on the net profit of the film? Nearly all of them. The problem is, Nobody ever orders. So nobody ever knows. So I, I deposit 100 quid into my phone, it's put his bank account, it comes back to me, you've accidentally put some money in the bank account. What's happened? Something's gone wrong. And I say, oh yeah, yeah, you're obviously not getting the email. We sold it to Japan, we're going to make a bit of extra money, we're going to share that, we're going to spread the wealth across the team because you actually came in and did a great job and we were trying to make this a proper social connection. You don't want to do this. So, blockchain can help these guys, but more importantly, blockchain can enable and facilitate them getting an honest day's pay for the job they do, which at the moment in the film industry, a lot of these guys don't get. We get it all the time. I've got a WhatsApp group, my one is a camera operator. I get a note in the morning that says, hold the rate, hold the rate. This producer, this day, we've been ringing around. He only wants to pay 200 quid for the day. They go the rate, 750. Hold the rate, because if we all hold the rate, that's the rate that the job's going to be done at. Shouldn't we rely on WhatsApp? I mean, I have to be honest here, I'm not really a WhatsApp user. I read WhatsApps when they come in. But I don't get why I need several applications to do the same thing on my phone because I'm old. So I actually look at them and say, why do they text me to tell this? Because I would have waited till the end of the day and opened it. I'm not normally the one driving the rate now, so. But this is where there is, and we've got the crew-based blockchain initiative running in our proof of concept that allows the crew to participate in the smart contract environment and have absolute real-time automated payoff the back of them turning up, them doing a the job, them delivering, and them going home with a smile on their face, and us thinking the job well done. I can now pay crew on a film literally within about half an hour of them getting to the end of their shift. Historically, I took three days to do that. Still could be the most people get paid in the film industry. The point is, is who are they more likely to want to work for next time around? Me or someone who may not get around to pay them. The industry's full of those people. Okay, so uh, you saw the uh, slide earlier. This is Capsule, 127 grand. We made this, we made it in 14 days. This is Edmund Kingsley, Edmund Kingsley's son. He's a great actor, Shakespearean actor. Really nice guy, it's a contained film, he spends most of the time in the capsule. The end of the film comprises, a little bit indulgent, I have to say, seven and a half minutes single take done by a steady cap operator. Yeah. But the point with this is, we sold this when it was on paper as a script. We were already gaining income from that before we even shot the film, before we even went through all the other theaters. And the problem we had was then keeping to the promises because we entered into a contract, into an agreement, that we had trouble at every stage of filming, of post-production, of sound score, of who knows what Foley is. Anyone know what Foley is? This is Foley. I'm doing Foley now. I'm making myself out of 
And they get yelled at. They want to see ADR. ADR's great. I get you, I bet you you don't know how many things you watch on TV have got ADR in. So there it is. And it's this dialogue replacement. And then the actor goes in, sits in the booth, talks to his script, gets recorded, and we dub it in. It's an automated process. It works, it does. But I have to pay for that, and it costs me 300 quid an hour for a booth and, and a sound engineer to make all of that happen. So if I wasn't expecting that to happen, that's a problem. Did that happen because we didn't plan it effectively? <coughs> we didn't shoot it effectively? The point is, is that if those guys know that work is coming because we've already flagged that at the point at which we're doing dailies, we can engineer a cheaper deal because we can engineer a deal around their work rather than the 11th hour where we're about to fly out to Canada sell for that thing. And with our post-production partners, virtual post-production now sitting on the blockchain, where we're able to post our dailies and we receive back a heart grade, I mean, colour image looking the way it will look when it gets exhibited. With them sending that back in real time or within about 20 minutes. So that we can see that, and that's enabled via the smart contract token. So if I share that token with one of the investors, all of a sudden they get temporary access to this and can look at it, and they can see what these images look like and get comfortable with it, then I can revoke that token, it's gone, and they don't see it anymore. That means we get a slick process. And this was the first time we started to trial some of this, and it worked. It was clunky, it was clunky as hell. We need a, a, a bag of high end coders. You can sit down and turn and cobble together into something sensible that is replicable on every single film we do. We know that, but we were frankly mucking around to see if we could make it work, and it did. What was most interesting was the response from people in our value chain who kept coming back saying, "This is great." I get this message that comes through over here. I get this thing that flags up on this uh, virtual screen I've got over here showing me your footage. And then I get a note that appears in the log next to it, giving me permission to go ahead and do this. And then if I notice about 20 minutes after I finish doing that and I flag it's finished, I get a text from Lloyd's Bank telling me some money's been deposited. Wow. That's cool. So I'll tell you what, the next time you ask me for a short notice job, you've got it. I'll do it. So it's got a lot of benefits in there. So it has a genuine prospect of actually delivering on, on, on the promise. But it is, it's a, look, it's a, um, I don't know, we're a long way off. But who thinks blockchain is actually here and ready as it stands at the moment? We've got these issues around standards. We've got these issues and challenges around this common or lack of common lexicon. We've got this issue around whether or not certain use cases are actually worth putting real effort into versus doing something else and going and working with something. Maybe it's better to do healthcare blockchain than it's to do film blockchain. I don't know, it's amusing. Is it? Who you knows? The answer is, is there are probably enough opportunities out there for a lot of people to get engaged and do something. But you go where your interest is. Sure. And I think that this still represents a dramatic area of interest which will scare the pants of the major studios and even the mini majors. But it will do it to the extent that it will change the way people will actually buy product. And we've seen that. When we've tested this, we've seen that. We made it available. You could freely stream it. Freely and available to you. And what it did is it took a penny off your pocket. Yeah. That's just like this. And then we made it an, uh, what do we call it, an honor payment. People didn't actually even have to pay unless they wanted to. And yet, out of 300 viewers that were tested through that, 270 people paid. Of the 270 where they were only obligated to pay just under a penny, nearly 60% paid back. And we quite like that. Now you can argue, as the academics will, but that's because it's a social experiment more than anything else, and when you feel good about paying a little bit more in a social experiment. But actually, it's probably more to do with the fact that we could tell them quite a lot about how they viewed the film, where they viewed it, how many times they viewed it, how many times they stopped, what they were probably doing at the point at which they stopped. Because we had all of this data, we shared it with each of the users and said, this is what we think was going on when you watched it. I don't know if that just scared them. GDPR will have a big impact on that next year, really will, really will. But nevertheless, it had the desired effect. If it changes the, the purchasing audience's behaviour, 
There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so I, I do think that there is a genuine prospect that we can rewrite this uh, economic power grid. This is one of these comments that's doing the rounds of the room, but I really do believe this. My view is, is that the only people who are getting in the way of this are going to be the major studios, because the force is strong in that one, and they really are powerful. You have no idea how powerful these guys are. You really don't. I wrote a script a couple of years ago for a film called The Man and the Moon. It did really well with um, um, people like Amazon Studios and others who make films from scripts that anyone can send in. The Man and the Moon is the fiction, purely fictional story of how Stanley Kubrick faked the moon landings. It's fictional, get over it. Yeah, okay, NASA may have had some issues getting up there, they might not go on the wall that monarchy and so on. The point is, it's a film about the power of the film industry. It's a film about the power of these people who NASA were prepared to engage with on a daily basis. There is a place called Shepparton down south, and Shepparton Studios is known as Little NASA. Because there were more NASA engineers from Houston during the filming of 2001 than there were film crew filming in 2001. It's hardly odd. We know that as a matter of fact. And actually, what we don't know as a matter of fact was whether they faked the moon happy. But I thought, what a great idea, I can make this film, I can write this story, make this film. Because half of this room, they're going to say, yeah, bonk it. There is no way that NASA would ever affect the moon landings. And this half is going to say, oh, do you know what? That's plausible. And the point is, is that's enough to mean that I've got twice as many people going to see that as I would ordinarily get with virtually any other titles. Play to my audience. So, Read and watch films like read stories and watch films like that because it will show you how powerful this, this group of people are. If you've seen the producers, it's a good example. If you've seen um, Hail Caesar, who's seen Hail Caesar? Oh, do you know, despite the fact it's quite an old story and the concept behind it, it's actually bang on. It is so accurate about the manipulation of the acting talent and the behind the scenes we call the below the line. Um, basically the technicians, the low-line talent, how to get exploited by the studio system. Huge. From starting to sound slightly socialist about this, I'm going out on strike on Saturday. I want to see my colleagues working in the picture house get a decent wage. If you care to join me, it's down in London, but it'll be a great fun, and there's a brilliant pub at the end of the picket line. Okay, so I think that the stories of how this is going to all happen over the next... I don't know, 10 years, whatever. I, I, don't, I don't get this. I don't think this is a decade long thing. I'm predicting that this is going to be much quicker. My view on this is that I think three years is the outside prediction. I think it would be even quicker. I'm predicting that this time next year, the next two films we put out, the next film we just put out, which is going out fully within the blockchain environment, managed all the way through, suit to that end to end, will have a better prospect of delivering dramatic changes. And it will do it because it's all focused around things you already know about, that you already understand. Storing records, exchanging the asset, exchanging electronic digital assets, building smart contracts with rules, good solid ground rules for the way our relationship will operate. And then it's about how we can make it happen and how we can verify that it has happened so we take payment. One of the challenges, and sorry I had this conversation earlier with someone I can't remember, who I did have a discussion about scaling. Yeah, thank you. I'm really sorry I can't. I'm running out of time, so I can't remember into that. But scaling is an issue. Scaling is an issue. We're slightly concerned about that. We found we could we could do around about seven transactions a second. When we took it outside of our normal garden, that dropped to around about seven transactions a day. Now you could just have a shocky code and we need some decent codes. Yeah, probably right. But actually, I also think there's some other infrastructure issues in there that need to be solved. So, want to make a movie? Anyone here want to make a movie? Anyone? I don't mean the comedy you might do in your bedroom. I mean, it'll be a proper movie. You want to make a movie? Great. So you can make a movie, but think about then how you're going to actually protect and recover all of the pain that you want for everything you do, how you automate that process, how you deliver this thing from, from a waterfall. If you haven't heard about a waterfall, do you have a waterfall in music? Waterfall concept. So what happens with waterfall? First person to get their money is typically the producer. 
Yeah. Then after the producer, anyone else who's deferred payment. Then after the people who defer payment, anyone else who's probably don't be a partner with you, such as your investors and maybe put money into making something. And that waterfall trickles down. By the time you get to the bottom, there's the old penny rumbling down the waterfall to the person at the bottom. We flip it on its head. Nobody in our production team takes a penny until the investors got their money out. Because that way we don't have that reputation for making films where investors don't see the money because then they never invest again. But then after that we make sure the team gets something. After that we make sure the actors and contributors to get something. Then after that we make sure our distribution partners do. But by doing all of that they try harder. By trying harder, by the time they get to us in the waterfall, instead of getting a penny, they're getting pounds. What's not to know about that? So yes, by all means, make a film, but think about these things here, because you're going to need to protect against it. Two and a half thousand, I can't use that, I don't know if I've got a point on that. Here. So, compact comparison. Two and a half thousand titles per week, largely manually taken down. With blockchain, we automatically redact those through Google. It happens within three minutes of the request going from the blockchain to Google. And then in terms of what's gone, the actual underlying field comes down in a roundabout day from the server that it's on, with the digital learning copyright being facilitated. It works. It's clunky, but it works. Okay, so look, as I started to talk about when I mentioned this issue of standards and the common lexicon, this is still very much an emerging space. There needs to be more collaboration, there needs to be more sharing of technological ideas and experience and understanding. But it's the people actually say, here's the common cause, let's do something about it and get on with it and make it happen. But if you do really dive in, and as we've seen in our proof of concept, this has got tremendous benefits in a short order of time. Tremendous financial, commercial, artistic benefits. It could be dramatic. It's Spotify to build something like this. It would be good. If we already know from the way it's Spotify all the work, is that they claim that the amount that they run from the administrative side of operating their servers is so high to prevent piracy that they can't share that with the artists. Well, get this, if you can also make that part of the process, we share a lot more with the artists. We know from our own examples that for every copy leaked, we lose around about five bucks of revenue. Five bucks, still five bucks. In terms of leaked copies, it's around about one and a half million or absolutely leaked copies. Not copies that get shared all the time, absolutely leaked copies. If we can stop that, we think we could do it. So watch out for our next two films, I told you. I'm going to finish with a plug. This is actually a Scottish film. Um, this one is, uh, actually I'm not going to tell you what that one is, you just have to go and buy it when it comes out. But uh, Black A is a story about an uh, inclusive relationship of people operating in Afghanistan between Christianity and um, Islam. And it's already pre sold and funded by the Islamic community in India. And they've done that because this is a war film that we are going to see. So hopefully, we'll get the opportunity to put something out quite special, get it onto our venture, the blockchain venture, and make some money from that that we can share with all parties concerned. That's me done. I appreciate it. I've probably gone ever so slightly over just about my own time. Just, just. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.